In 1980, Stephen Stainer had been missing from his family for seven years. He had spent those years with his kidnapper, Kenneth Parnell, traveling around California, moving from school to school and place to place. While kidnapped, Stephen suffered abuse, but he was also a child who was quiet and intelligent, loved the outdoors, comic books, his friends, playing sports and animals. But seven years after he was kidnapped from Merced, Parnell would kidnap again. Kenneth Parnell would kidnap five-year-old Timothy White and put a new child, a new family, and a new community through all too familiar horrors. The one difference in this case is Stephen Stainer, who will refuse to let Parnell, a man he considers a father, hurt another child. Join us for this episode of California True Crime, The Life and Kidnapping of Stephen Stainer, The Kidnapping of Timothy White. Welcome to this episode, the fourth installment in our Stephen Stainer series. With me, as always, are Charles and Sean. Hi, guys. How are you? Good. Good. In our last episode, we talked about Stephen Stainer's life as he grew up and what it was like to live with his kidnapper. We also talked about the methods Parnell used to control Stephen, the bond created by Stephen believing Parnell was a father figure, coupled with the fear of people knowing about the abuse he suffered and the fear that what Parnell told him about his parents being true and the sadness that comes with all that all lead him to think of Parnell as his father and stay controlled. In this episode, we'll cover the kidnapping of Timothy White and the things that happened leading up to the up to Stephen making the decision to save him. And we're covering this tonight because, as we said at the beginning of this, everyone has their own story. So a lot of this will be really familiar because it's similar to Stephen Stainer's story. But Timothy White, he's his own person. He has a family. All of these things happen to them. So we're going to go into detail. And I got most of tonight's information from the Ukiah Daily Journal and the Santa Rosa Press Democrat. Both of those are newspapers um, near where he is. Well, Ukiah is where he was living, Timothy White. So they have a lot of information about his kidnapping. During the seven years that Stephen is gone, his family, as we said in episode two, continue to search for him. They would never move from their home in Merced in case Stephen would come home. They sent flyers and posters around the state to different schools some including the one Stephen went to, but no one ever recognized him. Which isn't surprising because by the time Stephen turns 14 years old in 1980, he's six feet tall. So he looks much different than the small boy that would have been on the flyers. There had also been an increase every year in the amount of reports done on the Stainer family and their missing son. Every December, a lot of national and state papers would do anniversary stories, and they would appear on the news and other TV shows. It's worth noting that Stephen talked about only having uh, TV during small parts of the time that he's been kidnapped. So when Stephen is found, he will say he saw a missing poster of himself, but didn't know that his family was looking for him. And the Stainer family throughout the years is asked to look at photos of boys who've been found dead around the country to see if they could identify any of them or any of those children and Stephen, which is a heartbreaking detail to learn. I can't imagine what, how hard it would be for a family who's going through this to every year have this wound opened up with more news reporters coming in and, you know, anniversary episodes of news programs going back over the case. On top of which, like you said, I have law enforcement bringing me pictures of dead children. The The feeling has got to be, you know, I would on one hand hope that one of those children might be my son so we could have closure and then praying that it's not my son, but then knowing that each one of those photos is the is another family's tragedy. I, I don't even know how you how a normal person would deal with that, or anybody would deal with that. Yeah, it's a lot for them to go through. Their life never really moves on after that day that he goes missing, and they have to deal with, as you said, tips that come in that never pan out to be true. And you, I guess, you would start out getting excited at first, and eventually, it would be hard to to always be brought down back to life where it's it's not for you. It's not your child. And then the gossip and rumors that are going around as well. So there's just, and that gets even bigger when there's national attention and you're trying to find your child. So you're happy for that. But as you said, it just for them brings a lot of heartbreak, which is what they're kind of going through in 1980 before they will eventually find out that Stephen is alive and coming home. 
In 1980, while Parnell and Stephen are living outside Manchester, Parnell would get a job in Ukiah, California. Ukiah is the largest town in Mendocino County, with about 10,000 people living there in 1970. Like many of the towns in Mendocino we've talked about, there is also people living around Ukiah in unincorporated areas. It's part of the Ukiah Valley, which has wineries and is also known historically sort of pre-1900s for its hops growing. In fact, there's a town called Hopland near Ukiah, which just sort of shows how important hops are to the area. And there's a bunch of uh, breweries as well as wineries in the area. So Aaron Rodgers, the quarterback, grew up in Ukiah. An actor named Shiloh Fernandez, who is in the remake of Evil Dead, grew up there as well. Lyle Tuttle, he was a famous tattoo artist. And there's a, I guess, a branch of the People's Temple there for, I, that would probably be important to some of you true crime fans. It's also known for, um, I haven't seen this, but a Czech video game called America Truck Simulator, which is sort of amazing. And the, one of the biggest things there is a city of 10,000 Buddhas. It's one of the largest Buddhist temples and enclaves in the Western world. It actually sits on 489 acres with a complex of 80 acres that uh, compose. Uh, there's a university there that actually, you can take university classes. They actually have a um, primary and secondary schools. The city of 10,000 Buddhas was founded by a Buddhist monk who's in really integral into the uh, bringing of Buddhism to the United States and really gets more people excited about Buddhism in the West. The job Parnell would get was at the Palace Hotel in downtown Ukiah as a night manager and accountant. The Palace Hotel was located at 272 North State Street in Ukiah. State Street runs the length of Ukiah and it's sort of like a main street. The hotel is closed now, and the last time I checked, the building for the hotel, it's still there, but it wasn't deemed, it was not earthquake safe, so I believe it's up for sale. So if anyone's looking for an investment. In 1980, it was undergoing renovations and housed about 90 tenants on any given night. It's an older brick building that was built in 1891, and it's had some famous people stay there, including Black Bart. I was actually excited to, to hear that Black Bart stayed there because I'm actually looking at researching some of, his, some of the cases involving Black Bart for our second season, so we will be revisiting Ukiah. In 1980, the front door was an oak door with stained glass window of the Palace Hotel. The door opened up to a red carpeted check-in with wood paneling on the right side of the wall and a redwood china cabinet on the far wall. This cabinet displayed antiques and crafts surrounded by a large oak check-in desk. There was also a lounge and a restaurant downstairs, and I believe it's a historic site. Um, not just because it's been there a long time, but also because of the kind of architecture. It's a really beautiful building, so we'll put some pictures up. Parnell's schedule had him working six nights a week with only Fridays off. He would work the night shift starting at 7 p.m. and going to midnight, and sometimes midnight to 7 a.m. People at the hotel also said he held seminars on tax accounting and family finance for $100 a session. He was also opening his own office in Point Arena, where he did accounting and bookkeeping. If you remember, Point Arena was in Mendocino County, or is in Mendocino County, and a place Parnell and Stephen had lived. It's about an hour and a half from Ukiah, and Ukiah is about an hour and a half from where they're staying out in Manchester. So he's making a lot of trips around all over the place. So people are paying for his seminars. Yeah, he held them at the hotel, and he also, he's, like I said, he's opening his business. He held them, I believe, on family finances. And so... I know you talked before in a previous episode about a lot of these kind of shady business dealings he's doing and he's selling stuff on, you know, religious tracks on the, on the sidewalk. And, but it seems like he's actually making, I mean, good money at hundred dollars, a hundred dollars a person for these seminars. It seems like this is what he knows. Like this might actually be legit. Cause it seems like he gets a lot of accounting jobs. Yeah. He does do accounting for, I mean, we talked about the various places he did mm -hmm. it in Yosemite when he first kidnapped right. Steven. He did it for another company in Compchi, I think. And he's just opening this business. So I don't think it's quite open as a business. He's getting it ready. He has the office in Point Arena. Um, but he does do ses he does do finance sessions at the hotel sometimes. And when he is when they catch him finally after he's kidnapped Timothy White, there are a lot of people who come forward. He's well known in the community. But as far as how much money he's making at this time, I d I don't know. He's still getting a lot of money from his mother. At the beginning of 1980, Parnell began thinking about kidnapping another boy. His plan was to do the same thing, sort of the same way he kidnapped Stephen Stainer, and he was looking for someone who could help him, and his first thought was Stephen. At least twice, Parnell took Stephen to Santa Rosa to help him kidnap a child. 
Both times, Stephen refused or actively worked to thwart Parnell. And this is not the first time Parnell has tried kidnapping other children. His girlfriend, Barbara Mathias, also helped him try to kidnap children. And we talked a little bit about that. We know that because police talk to Matthias, but also mainly because when they find Stephen or when Stephen comes into the police station, he remembers much of the things that happened during those seven years and gives police that information. It was during this time that Parnell would also tell several people he knew that he wanted to adopt a child to increase the size of his family, or he just would speak with people about wanting to increase his family. Lots of people from his work sort of mention this when they find out he's kidnapped someone that he had talked to them about it, not kidnapping, but bringing another child into his life. Making a family is something that many people will initially use as the reason he was kidnapping children, including his own mother, who already knows a lot about his past. So do you think that that his mother was in in on this or knew more than maybe she let on? The police will always say there's never any indication that she was aware he had a child with him already or was getting ready to kidnap someone. They will find some letters from her to him where she was warning him that if he had someone with him that was dangerous. I don't, it never specifically says who he would go and visit her throughout the years. And Stephen would sometimes stay with a elderly neighbor that they were really good close with. So there's no evidence she ever met Stephen or had any knowledge that he was there specifically. But I think probably once police figure out his history and she already knows she's been through a lot of it. So it's possible she suspected, but there's never any hard proof. Right. And in the days leading up to Parnell kidnapping another child, he would tell a female friend that he had grown close to. Quote, there would be potential changes to his family that she would not understand. This same friend who had five children herself would say that Parnell had offered to be the father of her four-year-old son. Her son even started to call Parnell daddy. And this just reminded me of Barbara Mathias, who had a young son when she went to live with Parnell and brought him with her. And that son eventually would call him father as well. So Parnell is sort of worming his way into women's lives who have small children or small boys. And I'm not sure what's going on here with him telling so many people he's working with and friends that he may be bringing another child in. I mean, he's not using the word kidnapping. He's he's alluding to some legal way. I don't know if he's planning on staying in Ukiah after he kidnaps someone or not in Ukiah, Manchester, but I don't know what you guys think. Could be a way of him trying to feel out somebody to create a new accomplice. I mean, he, he did that with Barbara Mathias and we know that she helped him try to kidnap other children. Right, so maybe he's looking for someone to help him. Also, do you think it would be a way of deflecting suspicions suspicions from him if he suddenly starts buying children's clothing and buying more food and, you know, maybe keep the more observant people off track and say, oh, you know, he's got it. He adopted a new son. Yeah. I mean, like, he may be more brazen when he kidnaps Steve and he kind of takes him out of the area and moves around. Here, it seems like he's setting up his life and has plans to keep um, whoever he kidnaps in the area, which just seems a poor idea because I think maybe people, a little boy goes missing and then he has a new little boy. They might put two and two together. The other thing is that police will say once Stephen and Timothy are found that it appeared that Parnell was going to be moving both boys to Arkansas. So there's just a lot of things happening here. Him starting new businesses, him telling people he's getting a new child, but also making plans to move out of state. Without Stephen's help, Parnell needed to find someone who would be willing to assist him. This is Parnell's preferred method of kidnapping, and he's also 48 years old in 1980 and not in the best shape, so he needs someone who can help him. Parnell turned to a 14-year-old friend of Stephen's named Randall Sean Porman, who lived near where the Manchester cabin was. He lived with his mother and three siblings in a town called Elk, California. Elk is a small, unincorporated area in Mendocino County, 12 to 13 miles north of Manchester. In most of the research, Parnell's accomplice was called Sean Porman, so that's how we'll refer to him. Stephen and Sean met and became friends when they went to Mendocino Middle School together. The principal of Mendocino Middle School characterized Sean Porman as a nice student but with poor attendance. During his eighth grade year, Porman began cutting classes and becoming more and more withdrawn. None of his friends, family, or even girlfriend at the time could say why, what was going on with him. They also didn't know why he was not going to school or what he was doing when he wasn't at school. And by the end of his eighth grade year, he had fully dropped out of school. Looking for someone he could manipulate, Parnell hones in on Porman. Parnell would tell Randall something similar to what he told Murphy, but without the religion aspect. He said that he was looking to build his family, and Porman reportedly believes him. And there are several different reactions or reasons Porman uses uh, when when he's finally found out who did all this, and he's talking to police. 
for why he helps Parnell. So it's hard to say which one is actually correct. They could all be correct. Probably a mixture. They also come at a time when he's in trouble and he's just a kid. So some of it will, he will actually recant when he goes before a juvenile court. But they're all interesting because some of them really play on ideas and stereotypes at the time. When Parnell finally enlists Portman's help, he tells them that he'll give him $50, some marijuana, and whiskey. And that's most often what's reported. But in an article in the Santa Rosa paper, uh, the Press Democrat, on May 4th, 1980, they report that a transcript of Portman's testimony said that Parnell would give him $50 and forgive a marijuana debt that he owned Parnell. It seems Parnell was selling drugs to Portman and perhaps others, maybe other Stevens' friends, people in the community. And the two discuss this when Portman stay the night with his friend, Steven Stainer, on February 13th. So he stays at the cabin and Parnell approaches him and tells him that he would give him some money and forgive his marijuana debt, which just really reminds me of Parnell's grooming. Right. You said in a previous episode that Parnell's been using drugs and alcohol early on with Stephen as a way of grooming him and taking control. So it's it's not inconceivable that an area that already is kind of rife with weed farms, that, that Parnell could be substituting his income with selling weed around the area and then honing in on these kids that are coming to him. Yeah, we didn't really mention that, but Ukiah, in, in Mendocino County in general, there's a lot of, um, well, at this time, illegal weed farming. So it isn't strange. It's not necessarily strange that he might be selling drugs, but it is a way to ingratiate himself, I think, with certain families or even in this case with kids. And I think it's really important just to point out the difference between, like I said, most papers will say that they gave he gave him some marijuana and 50 bucks in whiskey. But the difference of holding over a marijuana debt and just giving him marijuana, I, that's an important difference, I think, because Sean Porman will get looked at. I mean, a lot of people wonder why he could help someone. He's 14. He's going through a lot. I think this could still go back into trusting adults. Uh, Parnell was 48 at the time. He's 14. Uh, no one should be saying anything to the 14 or about the 14 year old. He's only a kid. And being 48, you trust an older adult that you already know. I also think that it, part of that too is Porman's 14. And as an adult, Parnell spent his entire life building skills to play people. I mean, he, he's fooled everybody in town. I won't say everybody in town, but the general consensus is he's a good guy. People are paying him money for seminars. He's doing bookkeeping work and accounting work. And meanwhile, he's manipulating these kids and doing terrible things. I, you know, Poorman, from one point of view, didn't stand a chance. The other thing to keep in mind is the $50. This seems like a small amount of money someone would agree to. And $50 is only about... $147.58 in 2019 money. But it's important to know what's happening economically in the 80s. During the 80s, the world was experiencing a major recession. And in the United States, um, experienced massive inflation and unemployment. In California, in my research, a prop name, uh, Prop 13, had passed two years earlier. This was a tax-cutting measure. And it really changes everything in California. The state had difficulty dealing with the impact sort of of these less taxes coming in. And in certain counties, Mendocino in particular had some trouble adjusting to this new tax law. And there's also a significant amount of poverty in the area. Sean Porman is living in a, in a small place with his mom and his three siblings. So $50 to him might not have seemed like a big deal to the rest of us, but for him, that's a lot of money. Parnell would also appeal to Porman's vanity by telling him that he was chosen because Stephen wasn't, quote, bright enough to assist him in the kidnapping. Porman would also tell police that Parnell would threaten him with bodily harm and even use a knife to threaten him. The knife part is something he'll recant before a judge. And I just think, I think when Porman is found, he's, like we said, he's a kid. And I'm not trying to make excuses for him. He's, he does do something terrible. But he needs to explain that to police. And perhaps most people wouldn't look at this story and see how someone could be manipulated. So I'm sure he's trying to make it sound more dangerous. He's trying to come up with something that someone will say, oh, that makes sense. I understand. He will also say that he thought Parnell was, quote, a homosexual and was afraid of him. This connects with what we talked about in episode one to laws being passed um, about people who are, who are gay, but connecting them to people who are doing bad things to kids when that's not really what's happening. But we saw that in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and we're still seeing that in the 70s, even though some attitudes had changed. So Porman is talking about something that's really a big deal at the time. And there's no evidence that Sean Porman knew Stephen had been kidnapped. He will say that, I mean, here's his friend's father is coming to him. He doesn't know that there's anything strange about that. 
A classmate will also tell the press, though, that Poorman had told him Stephen had been kidnapped. Whether or not this is true, I think is sort of debatable. Stephen always says he never told anyone he had been kidnapped. And this is after they're found. So I think the press really descends on these places and just interviews everybody. So, so I somebody think, not necessarily connected to the case is, is, has, oh, I, I remember when Poorman said that to me in class. And he's the only one I can find in anything that says they knew. So I think it's probably just a, a fluke. And again, I, I mean, like we've said, this is years. I mean, the only picture of Stephen on the kidnapping is when he's a child. Right. And he's not an adult. I mean, he's an adolescent, but it, you know, he's six feet tall, doesn't look anything. And, and I, I can understand P- Poorman not knowing. Oh, yeah. I mean, what he was a kid attention. when that happened. Yeah, so they're the same attention. age. Right. There's no reason he should know. So Poorman decides that he's going to help Parnell. On February 13th, 1980, he's staying the night with Stephen, his friend, at the Manchester cabin. And Parnell comes to him to say, this is sort of the day. This is what we're going to do. And the two of them set out that night before Valentine's Day to Ukiah so that the next day they could find someone to kidnap. On February 13th, 1980, many people might have spent the evening preparing for Valentine's Day by planning to see the movie The Last Married Couple in America with Natalie Wood and George Siegel, or American Gigolo with Richard Gere and Lauren Hutton. Two movies I have never seen. Never saw them. I've seen, I've seen American Gigolo. I did not enjoy it. Or if you are a five-year-old like Timothy Lee White, you are probably filling out your Valentine's Day Valentine's to hand out to classmates the following day at school, which was always a big day because you got to give everybody something and there's always candy involved. It's just a thing I always like. Yeah, all I cared about was the candy. I didn't care about anything else. Hi, True Crime fans. I'm Erin. And I'm Shay. We host All Crime, No Cattle, a conversational podcast which focuses on true crime stories from the Lone Star State. We strive to bring you a balanced and well-researched story about Texas cases big and small. We do the research so you don't have to. We also end every episode with a good news story, just to remind everyone that real life isn't quite as depressing as true crime can make it out to be. New episodes drop every Thursday, and you can find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. All crime, no cattle, because crime is bigger in Texas, y'all. That night before Valentine's Day, Parnell went to Ukiah a bit earlier than usual to start his shift at the Palace Hotel. He also brought Poorman with him in preparation for the following day. Much like he did when he kidnapped Stephen, Parnell went shopping for supplies that he would need. He bought girls' and boys' clothing at a garage sale so that he could camouflage the child they would kidnap. At some point, he also bought toys, and he went to Rexall Drugstore and bought orange juice and sleeping tablets. Parnell would attend to his midnight to 7 a.m. shift as usual and Poorman would stay the night in one of the rooms at the Palace Hotel. The next day, February 14th, 1980, or Valentine's Day, Parnell and Poorman would prepare and go out looking for a young boy to kidnap. Parnell's plan was a little different than when he instructed Murphy to kidnap Stephen Stainer. This time, he just wanted Poorman to grab a child and put him in the car. Ultimately, the two would come up with a plan to pretend they were having car trouble to lower a child's fear. Also unlike the kidnapping of Stephen Stainer, where it seemed that Parnell had picked out Stephen in particular, although he and Murphy did try to take other boys on that same day he kidnapped Stephen, that doesn't seem to be necessarily the case here. According to Poorman, after Parnell's shift, the two drove around in Parnell's purple and white Ford Maverick in Ukiah looking for boys to kidnap. During the morning, Parnell tried to get Poorman to kidnap a couple of other boys they came upon. They seemed to focus on and around elementary schools. And just for an instance, there was a little boy who was outside St. Mary's Elementary School that Parnell had instructed Poorman to go get. Poorman went up to the young child, helped him get a slinky out of the the edge of the sidewalk. But when it came time to grabbing him, he, he didn't do so. And when he went back to the car, he would tell Parnell that the reason he didn't grab him was there was another child. So just like Murphy, Poorman is kind of wavering here. He has said he will help, but he, when they actually try and take kids, he's kind of coming up with reasons why he shouldn't. While Parnell and Poorman were driving around Ukiah, the day would be very different for the five-year-old boy they would kidnap, Timothy White. The papers refer to Timothy most often. Every paper is calling him Timmy. He's little when this happens. He's only five, but that just feels weird. I don't know him, so we're going to refer to him as Timothy in these episodes. Timothy White lived outside of Ukiah in a place called the Russian River Estates. The Russian River Estates are an area outside the actual city. 
It still has a Ukiah address, but it's about 15 minutes or 7 miles south of Ukiah on the 101. The homes here sit on or near the Russian River. The Russian River runs from the Pacific Ocean through east into Sonoma County and then north into Mendocino County and into Ukiah. And Highway 101 runs along these counties as well. Is this a, is this a lot more affluent area then? I looked it up. It didn't. It's hard to tell because I've never been to the the Russian River estates, and that's my initial was thinking was that. But um, I couldn't really tell. The houses seemed about the same price. They were nicer. Some of them are on river on the river. So, but again, just like a lot of the other places we've talked about, it's a pocket community off of away from the slightly larger Ukiah. Right. Timothy lived with his mother Angela or Angie White and his stepfather Jim White. Timothy's parents had divorced, and his biological father lived and worked in Southern California. Papers and Timothy himself referred to Jim White as his dad, so that's how we will refer to him. In 1980, Timothy was five years old and a kindergarten student at Yokayo Elementary School at 790 South Dora Street in Ukiah. The school is named after the Pomo Indian tribe in Ukiah. It was called the Yokayo. Because his family lived outside the city in a rural area and both of his parents worked, after school, Timothy would walk to his babysitter's house just a few blocks from where he attended school. At school on Valentine's Day, Timothy's class celebrated and exchanged valentines. School let out at 11 a.m. and Timothy loaded up his valentines in a plastic bag and walked part of the way to his babysitter's house with a friend from school. The two split up on the corner of Dora and Loose Streets and Timothy was to walk the rest of the way on his own. The last time he was seen was 11.30 a.m. when his friend walked to her own house. The last time Timothy was seen, he was described as 3 feet, 6 inches tall, 40 pounds, very blonde, shockingly blonde hair, blue eyes and freckles on nose and face, and a small scar on his chin. He was wearing brown pants, a light brown plaid shirt, cowboy boots, and an orange and yellow ski jacket with yellow stripes. After splitting up with his walking home buddy, Timothy White would come upon Sean Porman wearing a ball cap and sneakers and Kenneth Parnell pretending to have car trouble. Despite driving around looking for any child, when Parnell saw Timothy from the car, he instructed Porman that this was, quote, the one. And I don't know if he knows Timothy. Later, when Parnell brings Timothy home, he asks him his dad's name and Timothy replies, Jim. And Parnell says, that's right, Jim White. So it sounds to me as if he didn't set out to kidnap Timothy, but that perhaps he knows who he is. People will also talk about how similar Stephen as a seven-year-old and Timothy in 1980 looked like each other. As he walked by, Porman asked Timothy to hold a tire valve stem. Parnell sat in the front seat of the car. Timothy didn't want to help the pair and would start to walk away. As he began to walk away, Porman hesitated and felt it was better to let him go. He would report that he didn't want to kidnap Timothy. But as Timothy walked away, Parnell screamed at Porman to get the boy. Porman would say he sort of freaked out and tried to grab Timothy and put him into the car, but was unable to, and Timothy ran from his abductors. Porman chased after him, catching up and putting his arm around his head, covering his mouth with his hand, put him in the back seat of Parnell's car, and covered him with a blanket. Timothy will say that he screamed when this started to happen. Porman sat in the back seat with Timothy, who was very upset and crying, and Parnell instructed Porman to give him a sleeping pill and keep him covered the entire way. On the way back to the cabin in Manchester, Parnell threatened Porman, telling him that if he told anyone what had happened, he would frame him for the kidnapping and that no one would believe him. Parnell also never gave Porman any of the money he said he would. He did forgive his marijuana debt, but after the kidnapping, pivoted to threats to keep him silent. After the kidnapping, Porman and Parnell did not have any contact. Once they get to the cabin, Parnell strips Timothy of his clothes, puts him inside, and shuts the door and Porman leaves, hitchhiking and walking home. Despite this kidnapping not going as smoothly as when Parnell and Murphy kidnapped Stephen Stainer, there were many similarities, one of the biggest being that no one seemed to see Parnell kidnap Timothy. The first inkling anyone has that something has happened is when Timothy doesn't arrive at his babysitter's house on time. Police are called, and a massive search begins for the young boy. His friend tells police about the last time she saw him, and they go to the corner of Dora and Loose Street. They find valentines in the street near this location, which at first seems like a clue, but they don't have Timothy's name on them, so they don't think it was him who dropped them there. By Friday, police and the whole community are searching the South Ukiah area. Just like when Stephen is taken, people come together to do whatever they can to help find Timothy. Police and citizens stay up all night looking for him. Timothy's biological father drives up from Southern California to help with the searches. 
The Sonoma County Sheriff's Search and Rescue brings in dogs and spends 20-plus hours searching the area for any sign of Timothy or what might have happened to him. And they're searching everything, and in very rainy weather as well. In fact, in some areas in this, in Mendocino County, there's flooding and the rain is so severe. There are creeks and rivers, the Russian River, around Ukiah to search, and they look through it all. On Friday the 15th, a helicopter is brought in to look for signs of Timothy. It stays in the air for six hours and unfortunately find nothing. On top of searching for Timothy, police also begin receiving tips. While no one calls in to say they witnessed the kidnapping, the police received many calls of people saying they saw suspicious or unknown vehicles around town and want to give whatever identifying information they can. Timothy's family puts forth a $1,000 reward for his safe return. Police also issue bulletins to several other counties about the disappearance. They get a call about an unidentified boy involved in a car crash in San Francisco, but the boy has darker hair and no freckles, so they don't think it's Timothy. But all kinds of a tip like this start pouring in. They receive 25 to 30 calls a day from people who think they've seen him. The veterans of foreign wars posts in Northern California work together to disseminate flyers and contact their Southern California branches to ask them to do the same and to get the word out. The local board of realtors printed flyers and sent them to offices all over the state. And we saw this when Stephen went missing too. It's just, I think, how things are done when there's no, I mean, we're used to social media and Twitter and Facebook getting the word out. I think it's interesting that it's always the local board of realtors that step up their game to to print out flyers. I I never I would have never thought like a bunch of realtors were all about this. Well, and a lot of groups too, a lot of service organizations and things like that come into play. But well, I think I think what you said, us being spoiled with social media. I mean, nowadays it's so easy to get information in a heartbeat's notice. But how fast this was going on is pretty amazing. A door-to-door search is conducted in the area. Police from the area take four-wheel drive vehicles around the outlying areas of Ukiah, but nothing comes from this. And then some of Sean's favorite people start calling the family and the police the psychics. Although according to some of the articles I used, it also seemed as if the police contacted some of them as well. I couldn't find specifics about what any one of them may have told police or even specifics about who the psychics were that they contacted, but they do try to verify any information they're given. Same kind of thing, I think, when Stephen was missing. They don't have any information, so they're just looking for anything. According to Sergeant Bob Bowman of the Ukiah Police Department, quote, nothing panned out. On Tuesday, February 19, 1980, the police announced that their belief is that Timothy White has been kidnapped. The police don't have any new information, but this just seems to be the most likely scenario to them. A $15,000 reward is put forward for the safe return of Timothy White and is money pledged by Ukiah clubs and businesses. Police report that the Whites have not received a ransom note. And they discuss this throughout the paper several times, that this sort of sounds to me like they expected a ransom note. And to the police, the thinking is still that the most likely reason someone is kidnapped is either, unfortunately, for murder or for ransom. So these seem like the two, they're either going to find Timothy White, unfortunately, dead, or someone is going to send them a ransom note. So we're still in a time period where the police aren't thinking that somebody could be kidnapped for the same reasons that Stephen was kidnapped for human trafficking and sexual abuse. Right. And I think and we'll go through that as we get through all of the episodes, but that's unfortunately an idea that lasts well into the 2000s. In an effort to find any information, police hypnotize several possible witnesses who may have seen something to try and get any added information. Using hypnotism is a pretty common thing in the 1980s, and we've seen it in several cases. They used it in the Keddy case, and we're going to get into that a little bit more in when they hypnotize Timothy. If they are able to get any information from, from the people that they hypnotize, none of it leads to finding Timothy. Although the paper says a couple of people describe a car similar to Parnell's vehicle, but he's driving a white car, so that might just be coincidence. Much of the story for the family is very similar to the one that the Stainers experienced which had to be very hard for them. And after a couple of weeks, for instance, Timothy's mom, Angie White, had to go back to work. And it's heartbreaking to think that this is an instance, sort of what you can afford to do, how much time you can afford to take off to search for your child, how much, how quickly life goes back to normal. Not normal, but you have to get back to the things you need to do. She has a home phone installed in her office so she wouldn't miss any calls. She says she didn't get much work done. I don't think any of us would. And this is just, to me, this was just a heartbreaking detail. It's similar to what, like you said, the St- the Stainer family is going through. It's this balancing, keeping hope alive for the child that's gone, but then you still have a family to support. 
but that idea of how do you how do you go back to a normal life? Right. I don't think you ever do. But this is so quick. I mean, not that she cho- she's choosing to do this. No. But she could have chose to maybe just try to get back into a routine. It could have been horrible just staying at home, cabin fever with all this going on. Right. And she just tried to get back on track. No information is ever given to Ukiah police to indicate what had actually happened to Timothy White, who, as it happens, is being held outside Ukiah in a cabin in Manchester by Kenneth Parnell. After taking Timothy White, Parnell drove to his cabin and Poorman hitchhiked to his home in Elk. About 3.30 p.m., Parnell drove the eight miles with Timothy White to pick up Stephen from the school bus stop. Stephen would report that when he got in the car, he saw Timothy White. Parnell and he did not talk about White, but Stephen easily put together what had happened. Poorman never told his friend that he had helped kidnap White, but does tell police that at one point during the time Timothy was missing, Poorman mentioned to Stephen that he should take Timothy home. Poorman would say that Stephen was in full agreement. At the cabin, Parnell would begin the process of hiding Timothy from being recognized. He dyed his bright blonde hair a dark brown color and gave him the new clothes he had purchased. Just like with Stephen, he also had toys waiting for him like crowns, toy soldiers, and a toy canoe. Parnell also renames Timothy and gives him the name Charlie Parnell. And I found this interesting because if you remember earlier, I told you that there were several friends of Parnell's. He told he was going to be getting another little boy. And one of those was a friend who had a four-year-old son. And he seems to have shown some interest in the little boy and had asked him to call him father. And that little boy, his name was Charlie. So Timothy's replacing the child that he had maybe originally was grooming to kidnap or abuse. That's how it sounds to me. It could just be, I suppose, a coincidence, but that's a, an eerie coincidence. At the cabin, Stephen spent a lot of time with Timothy. He also saw Kenneth Parnell begin to tell Timothy similar lies to that he experienced when he was younger. And this was more evidence that the lies he had told Stephen were in fact lies. For instance, Parnell will tell Timothy that his parents gave him up because they couldn't afford him. Unlike Stephen, this lie didn't seem to work, and Timothy had a difficult time adjusting. Stephen talks about figuring out quickly that Parnell did not like when he was crying or upset, and so he kept that to himself. Timothy is upset a lot of the time. Timothy also pleads with Parnell to take him home, and Parnell would either ignore him and at least one occasion punish him with a spanking, and this made Stephen very angry. Stephen also spent much of his time caring for Timothy. According to his school, Stephen was absent during most of this period. He would sit with him, play with his toys to keep him occupied, and keep him from crying. The two also spent a lot of time walking through the hills of the ranch, something we discussed Stephen liked to do, and Timothy helped him with his animals and playing with Stephen's throwing knife. They played freeze tag and wrestled, and Stephen also read Timothy from his comic books. Later, when Timothy's found, he would often talk about his time at the ranch as a kind of adventure. He really liked Stephen, and Timothy's parents will also say that he didn't experience too much trauma from the event, And this isn't to say kidnapping is okay, but to note how this really sounds like it was down to Stephen taking such good care of him. During the 16 days that Timothy was at the Manchester ranch with Parnell and Stephen, Stephen took care of him, looked out for him, and early on knew he would be doing whatever he could to take him back to his home in Ukiah, something he knew because he had asked Timothy for information on where he was from. Stephen would later say, quote, I didn't think it was right for him to have to go through what I did. He really didn't have to. There was someone there who could stop it. On several occasions, Stephen would try to take Timothy back to Ukiah after Parnell left for work. The plan was for the two to walk or hitchhike their way into Ukiah. Stephen knew how to hitchhike as he had gotten himself to school that way commonly. But February 1980 was extremely rainy. There were floods all over the area and it made it difficult for traveling. Secondly, the Manchester Ranch is also a very, in a very rural area, so finding a ride at night after Parnell would leave for work was difficult. The other issue was Timothy himself. He wanted to go home, but he's just a little boy, and traveling in the rain and cold was difficult for him, and he was sort of resistant to the idea. After 16 days of being kidnapped, Stephen Stainer made a decision that would change the lives of Timothy White, the White family, the Stainer family, and would be akin to lighting a piece of dynamite and throwing it at his own life. In the span of a few hours after dropping off Timothy White at a police station, the pieces of Stephen Stainer's life will have exploded everywhere. And every secret he ever wished no one to know would soon be splashed across headlines around the world. This decision by Stephen to help a small boy would mean he'd be held as a hero, but it would also mean the end of his privacy and his normalcy. His worst fears come true. 
and he would spend the rest of his life dealing with this because he refused to let Parnell hurt another child. This is where we'll stop tonight. Next episode, we'll pick right back up on this night and tell you about the journey Stephen and Timothy take on March 1st, 1980 into Ukiah and the aftermath, because I've been waiting to get to these parts. The decisions many adults make after Stephen brings Timothy to Ukiah are sort of mind-boggling, and I desperately hope we learn from them and don't treat kidnap or any victims, really, like this anymore. Are you guys have any last thoughts? No, I think I, this is the part that I'm, through this whole story, I mean, we, we all know kind of how it ends, but this is the part of the story I'm, I'm, I guess, most excited to talk about because of the fact that Stephen's a hero. And I think a lot of times that gets overshadowed by other parts of the story. Yeah. And it sometimes gets, people pick up on it and they talk about it a lot, but what gets overshadowed in some ways is the price he pays for becoming a hero. So hopefully we can really get into that. Tonight's cold case, uh, the information comes from the Mendocino County website, an LA Times article titled Abandoning the Shame of Mental Illness from 2013, and uh, the Press Democrat article titled Man Still Missing in Mendocino County from 2013. On May 29, 2013, the Mendocino County Sheriff's Office received a call telling them that Eric Lamberg had been staying in the area and they had not been able to talk or get in touch with him since May 26, 2013. Eric Lamberg was from Hermosa Beach and in 2013 was 51 years old, 6 feet 5 inches tall, 200 pounds, with light brown hair and blue eyes. He was believed to be driving through the Mendocino area on his way to Oregon on May 26, 2013. Eric Lambert's car broke down in Leggett. He was driving a silver 2004 Honda Odyssey, which is actually Honda's minivan. It was towed to Laytonville, and he stayed two nights there at a local motel while it was being repaired. He called his family to tell them about his car and to let them know that he was fine. This was the last time his family heard from him. Mendocino County deputies confirmed that Eric Lamberg's vehicle was towed and repaired by a local mechanic and that he stayed at a motel for two nights. He checked out on May 28, 2013. On June 1, 2013, the Mendocino County Sheriff's Office re- received a report of an abandoned vehicle 20 miles west of Willits on Sherwood Road. Sherwood Road was a wilderness road, meaning it was mainly dirt and unpaved and stretched through the forest between Willits and Fort Bragg. Deputies confirmed it was Eric Lamberg's vehicle, the Honda Odyssey. Eric Lamberg was nowhere to be found, but it appeared his Odyssey had gotten stuck in a ditch in the road and was abandoned. Search efforts were undertaken, and search and rescue dogs picked up Eric Lamberg's scent in both an eastern direction and a western direction on Sherwood Road, but deputies did not find any sign of Lamberg. Deputies interviewed people who frequented the road and followed up on a potential sighting to no avail. His cell phone and credit cards have not been used. Eric Lamberg was struggling with bipolar disorder and was going to Oregon in 2013 for treatment. He has a wife and two children who miss him dearly and are still searching for him. Deputies have er issued a BOLO in 2013 to all Northern California law enforcement agencies. The Mendocino County Sheriff's Office is requesting anyone who has any information or might have seen Eric to contact the Sheriff's Dispatch Center at 707-463-4086. You can also visit the Facebook page run by his wife, Help Us Find Eric Lamberg, at Find Eric Lamberg. Thank you for listening to this episode of California True Crime. If you'd like to contact us, you can catch us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Cali True Crime. We'd love for you to leave us a review on your podcasting platform of your choice. We'd like to offer our sincere, special thanks to our quality control queen, Melanie Duncan. This episode was produced at Chateau Walnut.